Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail. The realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story, my best friend the Wendigo. Sometimes things happen to us that we just cannot explain. No matter how many resources are available or what information we can find, there are things that can never be understood, and that is a commanding factor of life. Now, a question. I know some. If not many of you have had friends, even best friends that disappear from your life without a rhyme or reason. That very same thing happened to me with my friend Marcus. We were best friends throughout high school and carried the friendship on well into our 20s, but one day he simply disappeared. I don't mean he was reported missing and the police were involved. I just mean he left without telling me, his best friend. I spoke to his mother and she said he had gone on a trip to northern Alaska. When I asked her why, she said, he never gave me a reason. I could hear the sorrowful tone in her voice. Like myself, she missed him too. But out of nowhere he came back. He told no one he had returned, and one day he showed up on my doorstep as if he had never left. I admit he looked good, better than I remembered. He seemed healthy, if you can understand. Marcus, you're back? I remarked, bewildered. Yeah, man. He said in his smooth demeanor. He had his hands tucked into the pockets of the jean jacket he was wearing. Got back a couple days ago. You look well. Where you been, man? I asked casually. I noticed his face was flushed red. But it was probably just the lighting outside because the sun was setting. Yeah, thanks. I've just been traveling. Finding myself? He answered. But he seemed indifferent about conversation. It made me wonder why he came here if he wasn't looking to talk. Well, that's cool. Did you want to come in? I asked while gesturing my hand through the door. He nodded and brushed past me into my home. Thanks, Derek. He said nonchalantly, as if this was a routine occurrence. Something up? I asked as I closed the door behind me. Marcus flipped his wavy blonde hair and sighed. No. Not really. I just have a proposition for you. It was strange that this was how he decided to start the first conversation between us in a long time. A proposition? Forgive me for saying this, but we haven't spoken in quite some time, man, and I don't know if I'm really in the position to dive headfirst into something new. No, it's not like that. Began Marcus. He didn't appear slighted by my response, which was welcoming to see. I was just wondering if you'd be interested in coming with me on a trip. A vacation of sorts. It wouldn't be long. Just a week up north. With who you? I asked with a hint of scrutiny. Yeah, just me. He said quickly. For some reason, his fingers were twitching like he could barely control himself from having a breakdown of some kind. Why so sudden? And why me? I mean, Marcus, where have you actually been this whole time? I find it strange you would come to me of all people for this hurried request of yours. I need someone to come with me. It's important that you understand, Derek. I'm not the same person I was when I left. I am something much more unique. But I cannot be left to the masses. I must be quelled. He was speaking in completely vague sentences the context of which I couldn't understand. I have to be honest with you Marcus, I don't know what the fuck you're saying to me right now. I wasn't going to lie but I saw a slight shift in his eyes upon hearing my candor. He sat down in my recliner and clasped his hands together. Listen, are you in or not? He wouldn't even look me in the face when he asked. He simply hung his head with his eyes on the floor. Well, I don't know. Where would we be going exactly? A cabin up north. Once we get there, I'll give you a list of instructions that you must adhere to. I promise you will understand. I took a deep breath. 
Clearly, Marcus was in distress and needed help. I wasn't going to leave him to fend off against whatever demons were riding his shoulders. I figured he had become an addict and wanted someone to look after him while he got himself cleaned up. I suppose. I said quietly. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. He said hastily. You won't have to pay for anything. I've got that all covered. Just be ready tomorrow morning and we will head up there. Tomorrow? Damn, that's definitely short notice. I said already thinking about what I would tell my boss. Don't worry about work, man. Just trust me, even if you've never trusted anyone. He remarked as if he read my mind. He then stood up and began walking to the door. I don't know what happened to you, but something's definitely different. I mentioned as I opened the door for him. You don't know the half of it. He said before walking outside, See you in the morning. Bring anything you're comfortable with bringing, but don't overpack. I nodded even though he was facing away from me, and he walked off down the sidewalk. How had he got here? Obviously he didn't drive if he was walking. Something seriously weird was going on with him. My boss was fine with me taking some time off. I figured it wouldn't actually last a week anyway so in my head all would be well. The next morning I was ready to go and Marcus arrived just after 9am to pick me up. I brought my things outside. I had only packed some snacks, a flashlight, blankets, a pillow, my medication and several outfits for the outdoors of life. The cabin has beds and blankets, said Marcus from the driver's seat of the old SUV he arrived in. Yeah well, I prefer to feel a sense of comfort that I can only achieve by having things that belong to me. If you say so, he remarked. His lack of engagement was already growing stale. I got in the passenger seat and we sped away without another word shared between us. Every so often, I would glance at Marcus to study him. While he did seem healthy, there was something innately different about him that I couldn't put my finger on. He was jittery, easily startled, and on edge. We drove for a good six hours before pulling off at a rest area. Marcus seemed alert, but for some reason he said, We're going to sleep here for the night. The night? Have you gone blind, dude? It's barely three in the afternoon? Yes, I know. I'm hungry and I need to rest said Marcus quietly. I can drive, man, if that's the issue? I asked reassuringly. He turned to look at me with viciously bloodshot eyes, as if he had been staring at the sun the entire drive. No, you don't know the way. You can tell me the way. I have GPS. No, Derrick. Just close your eyes, or do something for a bit. I'm hungry. The way he said hungry, was like a ravenous animal, like his desire to feed was overthrowing his decision-making. Fine, fine. Go get something to eat then, I said, kicking my feet up on the dash and leaning the seat back. Marcus stammered when he responded, no, not yet. When night falls, I will. You're acting really strange, man. Is everything good? Instead of responding, he only nodded slowly. I didn't say anything back, but I did watch him from the corner of my eye for some time. I noticed he was watching every single person who walked into the rest stop, like a starving fiend. I passed the time by reading on my phone, listening to music through my headphones, and after night fell, I closed my eyes. Up until I decided to try and sleep. Marcus hadn't taken his eyes off the entrance of the rest stop. I can't even recall if I saw him blink once. Luckily, I managed to fall asleep relatively quickly. However, I was awoken abruptly when Marcus heaved his body back into the driver's seat as if he were running from something. He was absolutely covered in blood. His mouth and most of his face, his hands, his shirt and pants, everywhere. Hey Marcus, what the fuck man? I asked intensely. He swallowed audibly. I feel better now. We can keep going. 
I could see his teeth stained red from the dim light produced by the rest area. No way, man. You're going to tell me what happened to you. Without looking at me, he said, I had to eat, Derek. We all have to eat. What in the fuck are you talking about, Marcus? What did you eat? A barrel of blood. Not quite. He then started the vehicle and shifted it into reverse. I reached out and shifted it back into park. When I did, he turned towards me and grabbed my wrist. His grip was insurmountably strong. It felt like he could crush my arm if he had the mind to do it. Derek, let go. Was all he said while his entire body was visibly trembling. I didn't know what else to do, so I listened. I carefully brought my hand back to my lap, and he shifted into reverse once more before bringing us back onto the freeway. I couldn't keep my eyes off him, but he wouldn't look at me anymore. Not until we reached the cabin. The overwhelming smell of blood had filled the vehicle and I had gagged a few times from it. The pungent aroma wafting off Marcus was almost unbearable. I checked my phone. Of course there was no signal out here, and I caught a glimpse of him watching me from the other side of the SUV. Calling the police is futile, said Marcus through his blood-stained teeth. Tell me what you did back there. I shouted at him unsure of what else to say. I did what I had to. He said while walking towards the front door of the cabin. Marcus, please man, I can help. Just tell me what's going on. He froze as if he really was about to answer me, but instead he reached into his pocket and pulled out a set of keys. Then, he unlocked the door and went in without saying another word. I stood outside for a long time. I didn't want to go inside and see him sitting there painted with blood, but something told me that Marcus needed help, so I went in. He was sitting on a dusty couch, in fresh clothes. He must have showered too because his skin was clear of the red tinge that had dominated it before. One thing was different though. He had lost most of his hair. I don't mean little clumps or bald spots. I mean there were only a few strands of hair remaining. Furthermore, he had patches of raw skin on his face and I'm sure they were on his body as well. I sat in a chair across from him and observed his seemingly deteriorating form. His eyes were fixed on the rickety floorboards beneath us, and he had his palms placed flat on his thighs. After five solid minutes without so much as a twitch, he finally raised his head. His eyes met mine, but his were almost black. There were dark blue veins forming a webbed pattern from the corners of his eye sockets, and his lips were dry and cracked. When he spoke, it was with a breathy and raspy tone. I'm going to tell you a story, Derek. When I am finished, you will do something for me. You cannot say no, you must do it. I can't make Promi dash. You must. Marcus suddenly shouted. He had raised himself up further, but something wasn't right. His spine was longer somehow, like it had been stretched making him appear much taller even when sitting down. Okay, okay, I said timidly. His shouting struck a drastically fearful chord within me. Good. He mumbled under his breath, then he began his story. As you know, I went to Alaska. It wasn't for nothing. I had actually met a girl up there on an app. He grinned slightly but it quickly faded. When I say this, I mean it. She was perfect, well, for me at least. He stopped for a moment and I noticed he was eyeing my hands, but then he continued, Anyway, her name was Claire, and we really hit it off. It was one of those love at first sight moments. Seriously, Derek, she was everything I could have ever wanted or needed in a woman. I uttered a sound of acknowledgement so he knew I was listening as he went on. She was a simple person and she lived in an old town. I can't even remember the name of it now but we made a life for ourselves there. However, she started acting strange. She would ask to have guests over constantly as if I wasn't enough. I don't say that in a jealous way. I mean she literally wanted someone else over every single day, 
and she reeked of desperation. It was like her life depended on it. While he spoke, one of his fingernails fell off and landed with a quiet ticking sound on the floor. Marcus didn't seem to mind because he kept talking. Eventually, I caved. I invited one of her friends over, a local guy who worked at the town's bakery. About an hour before he arrived, Claire called me into the bedroom. She had this weird, almost evil tone in her voice, but I disregarded it. I thought that she may have been looking to get intimate before this friend of hers arrived, but that wasn't the case at all. Are you sick, Marcus? I asked as I watched two more fingernails slide off his fingers onto the floor. He didn't answer me, not directly anyway. He looked up at me, and his left eye clouded over with a milky white color. Was he dying right before me? Marcus picked at one of the scaly gray patches of skin on his hand. It only made his other nails fall off, but he didn't seem to mind or notice because he went on. As I entered our bedroom, the door closed behind me. Claire was standing there with a rope and a gag. That only solidified my assumption about her need for intimacy, so I let her tie me up. But instead of getting frisky, she gagged me and left the room. I tried to get her attention, but obviously she couldn't hear me. How long were you like that? I asked gently. I wanted him to feel like I had genuine interest. Longer than I expected. I heard her friend come inside, and I tried to yell to get his attention, but it was no use. That's when the screams started. There were horrendous noises of agony coming from the other room, and they weren't from Claire. He sighed again faintly. During the conversation, his entire body had begun turning a pale gray color, and the last bits of hair he had left fell to the floor. There was this, squelching sound and another sound I can only liken to a saw-cutting meat. I hated every moment being tied to that bed in our barely lit room. Where are you going with all of this, Marcus? Are you saying Claire killed her friend? She didn't just kill him, Derek. She ate him. What? I exclaimed vehemently as my stomach turned. Yeah, she ate him, and when she was full, she brought the scraps of what was left into the bedroom. She removed the gag and told me if I didn't eat, she would consume my flesh as well. D, did you do it? I asked with curiosity. He looked down and then up before slowly nodding. I did. Marcus. Man. I don't know what to say. Just keep listening, he said solemnly. I had to hold my mouth open while she let the blood of her friend drip inside. She told me that if I did, then I'd never be sick again. I'd never worry about anything but eating. It made me remember all the time she had gone out for the night only to come back looking more youthful than before. I shifted in the chair and Marcus stared at my hands again for far too long. I was growing uncomfortable by his lustful gaze. The next time he spoke, his voice had diminished into something gravelly and hoarse. I did not fight her. I did what she asked. I hoped that she had just lost her mind and when she was satisfied, I'd make my escape. But I was wrong. The flesh, that is, the consumption of it made me a new being. It gave me strength vitality, and an iron constitution. I felt the best I had ever felt in years. But then came the hunger. Hunger? I questioned calmly, although I was reminded of when he mentioned how hungry he was at the rest area. Yes, Derek. The hunger for human flesh was insatiable. It didn't matter how much I ate. My body would feel like it had been further deprived of sustenance. I craved warm, running blood, almost like a vampire, and Claire did too. Before we knew it, we had slaughtered the entire town and nobody saw it coming. But after that, Claire, she turned into something feral, something less human and more animalistic. Like, like you are now? I asked with a hint of concern. Yes, she became this creature. It was grotesque and malformed. She wasn't my Claire anymore. So, 
I did what any loving partner would do. I put her out of her misery. You killed her? I ended her suffering. I see. That's when I came back down here. I couldn't live up there alone. But I also realized I couldn't be left alive at all. Derek, I desperately want to be with Claire again. Whether there's still a place for my soul in heaven or if I'll be sentenced to an eternal hell for the things I've done. As long as Claire's there, I'll be happy. What are you saying exactly, Marcus? I want you to kill me. You what? I admit, I chuckled a little because the notion was ridiculous. I want you to take the shotgun out of the gun safe and blow my fucking head off so I can't devour another innocent person. Marcus was being serious. I could tell by his tone and the longer this conversation went on, the more his body changed. I finally managed to ask the question I desperately wanted to know the answer to. Did you eat someone at the rest area? I ate an entire family. He said without remorse. I didn't know what to say. What could you say? All I could do was gasp while remaining at a loss for words. I called the police from the pay phone afterwards, so they should be there now. He began harshly. I chose that particular rest area because the cameras don't work. I had staked it out before even coming to you. It was all planned, but I did it for you. For me. You ate an entire family for me? No. I mean, I made it so you couldn't be connected to what happened. The police are none the wiser and in reality, you've done nothing wrong. This is fucked up, Marcus. I know. I know. I'm sorry, Derek. I need you to honor my request now though, before it's too late. What happens if I don't? I asked out of curiosity. Marcus stood up hulkingly tall and groaned a bellowing, low, rumbling roar. You cannot deny my desire for death, in my pain, like I ended the pain for Claire. His breathing was rapid and fierce, but he managed to calm himself down. I apologize for scaring you, he said in his gruff voice. Marcus, you were my best friend once. I can't. I can't kill you. You have to. This is why I came to you, because you still are my best friend, and I didn't want to ask a random stranger. They wouldn't understand. But you? You can understand. His face grew long, and it was accompanied by many painful grunts by Marcus. I need you to do this for me. I do not want to hurt anyone else. Even now the hunger calls to me. It is taking every ounce of strength I have left to resist lashing out at you, and devouring every tasty morsel of flesh covering your ripe and ravishingly delicious body. He shook his head like a madman before his eyes met mine once again. Please, Derek, I am begging you. I don't know what changed in me, but hearing my once best friend pleading for his death no longer perturbed my emotions. I stared at his rapidly transforming body for an indeterminate amount of time before getting up and walking to the gun safe. It was already unlocked. He must have done that while I waited outside. I reached in and grabbed the only gun in the case, the shotgun Marcus had mentioned. I assumed it was already loaded. If Marcus had planned this much then surely he planned that too. I walked back to the chair and sat down and a gnarled, black-toothed grin spread on Marcus's veiny, gray face. Thank you, Derek. I can't live with myself any longer, and this is the best option. Do not take pity on me. Do not feel guilty or ashamed. Take pride in the fact that you have expelled a ruthless creature from this world. I pumped the shotgun and aimed it at his head. My heart was pounding and my hands were sweating. Oh, one more thing, he remarked. In the glove box of the SUV are my life savings. Take it all and do with it what you will. I ask that you never tell my mother about this, or anyone else. It will be our secret. He then took one last deep breath. Okay, I'm ready. Do it. Just as I was pulling the trigger, 
Marcus's body twisted and contorted into a far more disturbing visage, and as the shot rang throughout the cabin, his blood and viscera splattered against the couch, the floors, the walls, and even the ceiling. His painful shrieking stopped and his body ceased all movements. It was over. I sat there with the shotgun in my lap, still aimed at Marcus's corpse for most of the day. I couldn't bring myself to get up or do anything else but stare at my headless former best friend. Eventually, I found the will to stand. After I was on my wobbly two feet, I took a sheet from one of the bedrooms and draped it over Marcus. I searched the entire grounds of the cabin for a shovel because I wanted to bury him, but I couldn't find one. It was cold outside anyway, and I'm sure he wouldn't want me to die from digging his grave. I did, however, find some matches. It was the middle of winter, so I thought it would be better to just burn the cabin down. I didn't want Marcus's body to rot there on the cold couch, and as I dropped a lit match on it, the fabric immediately engulfed into a mighty blaze. I walked out of the cabin and got into the driver's seat of the SUV. And that's when I remembered Marcus had the keys. I couldn't help but laugh about the irony of it all. Marcus had left ten grand in the glove box for me. I ended up having to hike down the driveway and up the road until someone stopped to pick me up. They drove me to the nearest town, Grand Marais, I think it was called. It was a small town, but the people were friendly. I rented a room at their local inn and have been here for three days just thinking about Marcus and what he went through. I thought about if I was responsible for the family he murdered and ate, but I had no idea what was going on at the time. I was only along for the ride until I had to play my part, my role in ending Marcus's painful life. If your best friend, or even friend returns to you after having been gone and without contact for years, be careful if they ask for you to take a trip with them. And always remember, the mysteries of the world can outweigh grounded reality. Nothing is as it seems, even Marcus. Be safe, everyone. I hope none of you look down on me. Second story. The Feral Forest. I have seen the ice sheets in the Antarctic and the sand dunes in the Sahara. I saw the curve of the world as I floated in zero gravity, and I felt the crushing weight of the sea 400 feet beneath the waves as I explored unknown wrecks. Three ex-wives, eight recognized children, and none of them deserve the fortune I have accumulated. And yet eagerly they wait, because they've heard the rumors. I hear the whispers in the halls beneath my office. Murmurs of cancer, the bad kind, the type of cancer that you don't survive. It's true, non-small cell lung cancer is the biggest killer in the USA, and I just found out that I've got it. When I was 20 years old, my father got me working for him in our family grocery shop, Walker & Sons. He was ecstatic. The shop was started by my grandfather and bared the family name, and my father was ready to hand me the lead. In a single day, I saw a demand that we could barely supply, and as I flipped the door sign to closed, I asked my father why he'd never bothered to expand. This shop isn't about the money, he'd stated hunched over a dustpan and brush. Pop built this store with his own hands so that he could support and raise a family. Money can buy you a lot of things, but it won't buy you happiness, it won't buy you love, and it can't buy you good heart. He stood up and arched his back, clearly in pain. Seven years later, when the 25th Walker and Son supermarket opened, I was on my yacht with a group of entrepreneurs and philanthropists that had become my friends. I had proved my father wrong for the first time. When I was in my mid-thirties, supermarkets were just a small drop in an ocean of investments, startups and ventures. I was one of the super rich, the top 1% of the top 1%. By that time, I could promise you that there was at least one item, in any room, almost anywhere in the USA, that my companies had some part of manufacturing, designing, or constructing. That's when I met Hannah and found a love with a price that would prove my father wrong a second time. 
I nearly lost myself back then. Hannah spent her time looking after my first two children while I got high on whatever I could get my hands on. Meanwhile, the money kept us together. She was happy as long as she had a credit card without a limit. Thousands were spent on designer shoes and clothes. Tens of thousands were spent on nannies. Eventually, even the money couldn't replace what she really needed. A loving husband. She cost me millions of dollars in settlements, and I can guarantee you she isn't seeing another cent from me. I won't bother going into my other ex-wives or children. Let's just say that it was a mistake to marry and a mistake to breed. I never could keep my eye away from a pretty young thing and was in the haze of my thirties that, unbeknownst to me, I would give myself this incredible opportunity. I didn't really care at the time. To me, I remember seeing it as a chance to play God, and that's something I was never going to turn down. At this point in my life, it was rare for me to have a day of sobriety, and when I did get past the hangover, I wasn't of much use to anyone. The letter had been sat on my desk for a couple of weeks before I got around to opening it. It had managed to stay at the top of the pile because the man that had delivered it to me had been stubborn enough to insist it was to be hand-delivered by him. He waited outside for nearly five hours. When he was finally sent up to see me, he simply handed me the letter and left. The contents described a project unlike anything I'd ever heard of. It asked for a hefty amount of money just to begin, and then an annual sum to cover the costs of staffing and research and development. I couldn't give it to them fast enough. I secured myself a line with the head of operations, Mark Young, and told him I was always on the other line. Mark purchased a vast amount of lush forest land, in an area I won't disclose, under his own name with an account funded by me. He erected a wall around the perimeter and hired 24-hour surveillance. Not a single spot in or around the forest was unseen at any time. With that, and a tree canopy thick enough to avoid any potential satellites snooping on us, we were safe. A building large enough to be a small town was constructed. It had a food mall, a hairdresser, a small hospital, staff living quarters, and everything the workers would need in their new home, for however long their contract was for. Mark's plan could never have come to fruition without me, so I owned him. Between ourselves, we called it the forest. In public, we didn't talk about it at all. No one did. The staff were looked after as long as they didn't ask any questions. We tried our best to keep the sections separate, and in general, everyone was happy to keep their knowledge to themselves. Our first step was to buy the orphans. We purchased 25 healthy baby boys and girls from different orphanages of different ethnicities and countries. We raised them without language, without education, without love. Once they could walk, they were taken from the nursery and placed into the nest. The nest was designed to introduce the subjects to the world. It was a simple three-walled room with a ceiling to keep them dry and a small outside area enclosed by a simple chain-link fence to keep away any animals. There was nothing in the nest except for grass and mud. We didn't clothe the subjects or give them beds. Mark wanted to know what a real human was like. Each morning and night, a siren would wail. From a hatch in one of the walls, we would drop cooked meats. As the children grew older, they began to fight for the food scratching, pushing, and pulling at hair. Nothing was against the rules when food was involved. Once they were five, male subject six wandered up to the fence and put his face against the wire. His body was already marked with scars and bruised from that day's fighting. Without much hesitation, he clambered up the wire frame and dropped down the other side. From that moment, the subjects were free to roam the forest. As puberty set in, the forest became a difficult place for the girls, and consequently, the boys. Under the circumstances, it was difficult to say if consensuality was something we could ever consider. These were humans, 
But they did not have a language beyond grunts and shouts. They did not have law that permitted or denied certain acts. Everything was natural. This was the first time we saw something that divided the pack. Suddenly, the boys were no longer happy in each other's company. With sex came ownership, and with ownership came an unwillingness to share. The biggest of the boys were also the first to hit puberty. Male subjects 1 and 12 each took control of a large proportion of the girls. Leftover was the majority of the boys and a couple of immature girls, who unfortunately suffered for the next few months until they were allowed into one of the tribes. Food became a battle between the men. Three male subjects were killed in as many months, another simply died from starvation. However, when male subject 7 reached the brink of hunger, he warily approached the tribe of male subject 1. On his knees, the nearly man crawled up towards the clan resting beneath a large tree. Subject 1 was alert, watching with wide eyes as he approached. As the boy got even closer, Subject 1 stood and marched over. The girls were getting restless. The boy stopped moving and shielded his face with his hands, peering through the cracks in his fingers. In a moment where the choice was violence or sympathy, this was the first time a subject had shown sympathy. Subject 1 nuzzled the boy away with his foot, pushing him from the group. Seven was too weak to even crawl away and fell to his side. He died the following day. It was during this time, when the feral children were nearly fifteen, that I decided to enter the forest. Mark had argued with me furiously right up until I told him I'd pull the plug on the funding to his project if he didn't let me in. He let me join the group with a scowl and insisted I was as accurate in mimicking their condition as possible. In his words, they should have no reason to believe I hadn't been living there for my entire life. And so, Mark Young watched as his 40-something billionaire investor took to the forest stark naked and eager to begin. I sauntered up to Twelve's tribe with my hands swinging by my sides. The boy shot up to me, screaming and hollering in my face, trying to push me away from the girls. I'd seen him do this to the other boys, and usually it worked. I tackled him to the ground and punched until he was spitting blood and barely moving. Dominance was key. The tribe became mine, and I took seven girls from the boy I left wheezing on the grass. He stumbled away from us, back toward the other boys that had been confined to their own company in more recent times. My girls were beautiful. They were young, fit, athletic, and the sex was incredible. It was so primal and instinctive. I've honestly never had such insatiable urges, not even the drugs compared to it. Quite frankly, I'd never been happier. Over the course of a few weeks, I gave them names that suited their faces, I learned each of their quirks, I stood my ground against any of the boys that tried to take my throne, I got in fights to win my tribe our food, and I never spoke a word. I was only planning on spending a couple of days in the forest, but I stayed for four months. Once I finally left the forest, I never really managed to fit back into the real world. My mind kept drifting back to my girls. My third wife was nothing compared to them. My kids were screw-ups, my businesses all but ran themselves, and the world outside of the confines of that forest was lackluster and meaningless. When Mark gave me the call nearly five months later, I felt a happiness I hadn't felt since I was in the forest. Three of my girls were showing signs of pregnancy. Three. I gave my wife whatever she needed in order to have her sign for a divorce and flew to the forest. I watched them on the cameras. They were beautiful, flawless, even. Twelve had reclaimed the group and I felt rage building inside me as I saw him laying with my girls. I nearly threw up when I saw him sleeping with them, two heads nestled into his neck. It should have been me. It should always have been me. I stormed back into the forest with fire in my eyes. 
The boy was alerted to my presence by the frightened noises the girls made as they scampered behind the trees for cover. I would never hurt them. Twelve was a bit bigger than when we last met, but not by much. Not by enough. I think I broke one of his arms because he ran off into the forest whimpering with it held to his chest. I took no time asserting my dominance with the girls. It was good to be back. The world was perfect again. Two of the children survived. Once the first was born, Mark and I agreed that more food was needed to be dropped to feed the increasing population. The other tribe also had two babies, and it was important for us all that our girls were getting enough to live. Male Subject 1 and I had come to an amicable, unspoken agreement that we would each take half of the food that was dropped. The other boys scavenged what we left behind. Every six months I had a checkup with the doctor in the building attached to the nest, and after a few years I stopped talking altogether. My companies continued to profit, my children did not care for me, or I for them, and I truly needed nothing more in the world. Today I had my biannual checkup with the doctor. I've been living in the forest continuously for 17 years. The sounds of the city drive me crazy. All of the engines and horns and shouting and bright lights all through the day combine with the foul air and make my head spin. The screen on this computer is hurting my eyes and it takes me forever to find the right key. Mark is still watching me every day. He says he might join me next year, when he retires. The doctor flew in a specialist who confirmed the cancer in my lung and was told not to ask any questions. What's funny is that, even now, I have the chance to prove my father wrong for a third and final time. My father said money can't buy a good heart, but it can buy a good lung from a willing donor. The truth is, my sons have begun to best me in the forest. I do not have much time left with my girls before a new king heads the pride. If I do get a transplant, I must either go back to the real world, or live out my days shunned from my own tribe, which I cannot bear to do. I'm sorry, Mark, but it looks like you'll be going in alone. I have seen the ice sheets in the Antarctic and the sand dunes in the Sahara. I saw the curve of the world as I floated in zero gravity, and I felt the crushing weight of the sea 400 feet beneath the waves as I explored unknown wrecks. Three ex-wives, eight recognized children, and none of them deserve the fortune I have accumulated. But thirteen girls, fifteen children and nine grandchildren, along with an entire forest of people, true people, deserve every sin I have ever earned and ever will earn. When I die, all of my savings and subsequent earnings will go directly to the forest, to provide space to expand and grow. Thanks for the ride. Third story. Don't go into the forest after sundown. My husband and I live in a house that's somewhat secluded. Our neighbors aren't the type you can just say hi to over the fence, and a large, thick forest backs our property. For the past year that we have lived here, I have gone on a run along the forest path almost every morning. My husband likes to sleep in, whereas I've always enjoyed my early rises. Last week, we went to a friend's birthday party and were out late. I ended up sleeping in and missing my morning run. I had a few chores to do and by the time 5 p.m. rolled around, I decided I wasn't going to miss my run that day. I stepped out onto the back porch and took a deep breath as the sun was beginning to set on the horizon. My husband stepped out and gave me a lazy smile before he kissed me on the cheek. I told him I'd be back before it was dark and headed off. It started off like any other run. I take the same path each day. It's a little overgrown but still obvious enough and easy to follow. I was only about 10 minutes in and I started to notice something. It was quiet, eerily quiet. Normally I can hear birds leaves in the breeze, and bugs chirping. But it was just complete silence apart from my own breathing and heart beating in my chest. I found it creepy, but shrugged it off as something to do with the timing of the day. 
The next strange thing happened only a few minutes later. There's a part of the path that wraps around this massive gum tree, the type that you can't see around when you stand in front of it. Well, I reached that part of the path and it was gone. Completely gone. Not like someone chopped it down and there was a stump or a hole in the ground left. It was like the tree never existed in the first place. There was grass and fallen leaves in its place. It looked like any other part of the forest floor, untouched for years. I was starting to get a bit freaked out. I run this path every day. I know this tree is meant to be here. I remember the first time I saw it. I was in awe at the size. I made my husband come for a walk with me the next day so I could show him too, and he was also impressed by the sheer scale of it. It didn't make any sense that it had quite literally vanished. Even if someone was going to chop it down I wondered if it was even possible to do it in such a short amount of time. I only just saw it the day before on my usual morning run. The practical, logistic part of my mind came to the conclusion it must have been chopped down. I decided I would wait to talk to my husband about it when I got back and maybe even bring him with me to have a look the next day. Maybe he would have an obvious answer that I was missing. Perhaps I could contact the council and ask them about it. I shook it off and continued along the path. As I continued running I started to get this off feeling in my stomach. Something just didn't feel right but I didn't know what it was. After a while, I noticed that the sun was setting. Fast. I was losing light quickly, which didn't make any sense. I only left at 5 p.m. The sun wasn't due to set until almost 7 and I had only been gone about 20 minutes. I looked at my watch and sure enough, 5.23 p.m. I checked my phone and it said the same. Just to be sure, I opened up the weather app and checked the sunset. 6.46 p.m. I was standing in almost darkness staring at my phone in total confusion. I had no idea what was going on and it was scaring the crap out of me. I knew the trees would make it dimmer than out in the open, but this was different. I decided enough was enough, and I was just going to cut my run short and head home. I turned around and began running back the way I came. After about another 10 minutes of running, I was stopped in my tracks and I felt my heart almost stop. There, standing on the path staring directly at me was a moose. Those things are insanely huge. But the weirdest part about it all was I live in Australia. We have just about every deadly animal on the planet, but we sure as hell don't have moose wandering around and I certainly had never seen one in the last year I had been coming through the forest. I stared at this creature for what felt like an eternity. My heartbeat pounding in my head as my mind raced. It just stood there, eyes glowing in the dark, staring into my soul. I was frozen in fear, unsure of what I should do. Then, after I felt like I was going to throw up from fear, it finally broke eye contact and just walked away. I stared as it strolled out of sight as if nothing had happened. Once I could no longer hear the footsteps, and I was back in complete silence I began sprinting. I was way too terrified to be in this forest a second longer than I had to be. I ran and ran until my lungs felt like they were going to give out. I thought for sure I should be reaching the clearing soon, but the more I ran the more it felt like I went deeper and deeper into the woods. I glanced at my watch and my breath hitched. 9.42 p.m. It's not possible, I said to myself. It can't have been four hours. My whole interaction with the moose, although felt like forever, in reality only lasted a few minutes. I pulled out my phone, and again it matched what my watch said. I tried to call my husband, but I couldn't get any service. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. It was pitch black now, and I had to use my phone torch to illuminate the path. My mind was racing with some kind of way to come up with how this could be happening, but I had nothing. I decided all I could do was keep following the path and hope that soon enough I would come out and be home. I was exhausted from running for so long, so I walked for a while, 
constantly checking my phone to see if I got any reception to try and call somebody. I knew that I should have been out of the forest by now. I was trying my best to stay calm, but I was panicking internally. Suddenly I froze with fear when I heard a deafening, guttural scream in the distance. I had never felt so sick in the stomach. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I felt like I was about to pass out. It was unlike anything I had ever heard. It didn't sound human, but I couldn't think of any kind of animal that makes that noise either. I turned the flash off my phone. For some reason, standing in complete darkness felt safer to me at that moment. I didn't dare move as I intently listened for any more noise. Not a sound. Not even a cricket or a breeze. The scream came from behind, and so I decided all I could do was keep moving and hopefully get further away. I'd heard online that mountain lions make terrifying screaming noises but again, to the best of my knowledge there are none in Australia, and certainly not in my area. Either way I was not interested in finding out, so I picked up my pace as I continued down the never-ending path. Then, I heard it again. Only this time it was much louder, meaning only one thing. It was getting closer. I broke into a full sprint, the adrenaline burst giving me the extra energy I didn't know I had. I ran for as long as I physically could before I had to slow down to catch my breath. I glanced at my watch again, 1.05 a.m. I let out a short laugh in disbelief. I closed my eyes and rubbed my temples as I took a few deep breaths. I was too afraid to stay still, so I began walking again. The forest felt never-ending. There was no sign of a clearing or anything that looked familiar. No matter how much I moved, I just seemed to go deeper and deeper into the thick woods. I no longer even had a path. I was stepping over branches and bushes trying my best not to trip. I was watching the ground for so long, I forgot to look ahead of me, and when I did that was when I saw him. Or rather, it. Standing just a few meters from me, I could make out the figure of a pale person with their back facing me. I should have been thrilled to see another person, but for some reason their presence irked me, and right before I was about to blurt out something I stopped myself. It was hard to make out many details in the dark. My eyes had somewhat adjusted, but from what I could see he was just standing there, facing the other way seemingly doing nothing. He looked bald, and I struggled to make out any clothes on his body. As I was studying him, that's when it happened. His head slowly turned until it was facing me. My breathing stopped when I saw its face. Instead of human eyes, it had two large black circles that looked like mini abysses. It had no nose and a mouth that matched its empty eyes. When I didn't think it could get more terrifying, the creature slowly began to stand and I realized it was actually squatting initially. I watched in frozen terror as the creature's long, skinny legs came into view, right as it dropped its freakishly long, skinny arms at the same time. It must have been more than ten feet tall. Once the creature had fully stood up, it turned towards me. I was too scared to move, to think, to breathe. All I could do was watch. It stared at me for a moment before dropping its jaw to let out the most unearthly, thunderous roar you could imagine. This was enough to snap me out of my frozen state of terror. I turned on my heel and sprinted in the opposite direction of the creature. My chest was burning as I ran as fast as I could. I refused to look behind me, but I could hear the thumping legs following behind me. I had no sense of direction, no plan. All I could do was run. I still couldn't see that well, and so I hadn't seen the edge until it was too late, rolling and toppling down a steep hill until I landed in the thick brush at the bottom. I groaned in pain, winded from the fall. I blinked a few times before looking up at the ledge I had just fallen from, where the creature suddenly appeared. My eyes widened and my heart raced as it looked around. I thought for sure this was it. There's no chance I can outrun this thing in my state. 
just as I was reflecting on all the things in life I had missed out on. The creature turned away and walked back into the trees, out of sight. I let out the breath I didn't realize I was holding on to. The bushes must have swallowed me up enough so that it didn't see me. I checked my watch again. 4.59 a.m. After laying there for a few minutes to catch my breath, I slowly sat up, wiping the tears from my eyes as I could finally think for a moment. When I felt ready enough, I rose to my feet and looked around. I then noticed the path, a very familiar path. It was the one I ran every day. I began following it, hoping and praying with every step that my ordeal would finally be over. After a while, the forest started getting thinner, trees more spaced out, until finally I could see a clearing with light. I audibly gasped as I quickened my pace into a full sprint towards the opening, and when I came out on the other side I could see the sunrise. Tears filled my eyes as I saw my house in the distance, and I continued running until I got to the back door. I burst into the house and saw my husband sitting in the living room with a mug in his hand. He turned and gave me a puzzled look when he saw me. You all right? He asked. I stared at him in disbelief. Why was he not more concerned? Why hadn't he been out looking for me? Are you joking? I've been gone all night. I got lost and I... So many crazy things happened. The time went all weird and dash. All night? What are you talking about? You were gone for like 20 minutes. He responded, totally bewildered by my shouting. But the sun is rising. I just saw it when I was coming back. I gasped, still trying to catch my breath. No, that's the sunset. He rose and came over to me, concern on his face. He pulled out his phone and pointed at the lock screen. Look, 5.24 p.m. You were gone for less than half an hour. Fourth story. An encounter with a Wendigo. At one minute to midnight I took out the shot glass and put it beside the bottle of Jägermeister. I don't drink anymore after what happened to Pop. The one exception is the first day of September. The house is dark except for the warm glow of the three bulbs above the dining room table. I rub my tongue against the inside of my cheek. My mouth always goes dry. The only sound is the incessant ticking of the wall-mounted clock. At midnight the soft bell sounds, a miniature version of church bells. I fill the glass and hold it aloft for a second and swallow with a deep breath. The subtle burn winds its way into my throat and stomach. I wash the shot glass by the light of the moon shining through the kitchen window. Loretta wouldn't mind my drinking, but a used shot glass beside the sink raises questions. And I never like to talk about it. All these years later I still have nightmares. What I saw up on that mountain left a greater impression than any other event in my life. More than my children being born and my father drinking himself into an early grave. Loretta tells me I should talk about it. That it would help. She might be right. She always is. So here goes. I joined the park ranger service right out of school and it was a perfect fit. I took to academics like a fish to the desert and the outdoors always called. I passed my time in school daydreaming of the weekend and hiking or fly fishing with Pop. In the summer of 89, I was stationed in the Appalachians. Our jurisdiction encompassed trails leading all the way up the mountain. Up there the spruce thin out and clouds hang heavy even in fine weather at the base. I spent the summer clearing fallen branches from the walking trails after a couple of vicious storms over the winter. It was hack work reserved for the junior, but the truth of it was I didn't mind. The peak of the summer heat was spent and visitor numbers dropped as the weather began to turn. Persistent drizzle had kept me desk bound for the morning, and we were about to get lunch when he burst through the door. He let out a moan and collapsed to the floor. Stanley leaned down and propped him in a seated position. Water dripped from his shoulder-length hair. His limbs hung limp by his side. I handed Stanley a cup of water. 
Stanley used his index finger to push down his chin. When the water hit his tongue, the man tensed and his eyelids flicked open. He flailed his limbs and knocked the glass from Stanley's hand. The glass shattered on the floor, but the man paid it no mind. It is out there, he said. What is? The man half turned and gripped Stanley's shirt and made balls with his fists. He repeated himself, pausing after each word. It is out there. He started to sob. He released his grip on Stanley and buried his face in his hands. We lifted him onto a chair, and he pressed his face against the table and bawled. I grabbed the rucksack he had dropped to the floor. On the bottom right was a name tag behind a plastic sleeve. Lenny Porter from San Diego. There was a number at the bottom. I'll make the call, Stanley said. When Stanley returned, Lenny was sat up staring blankly at the wall with red eyes. His face was gaunt, like he hadn't eaten in a week. Stanley closed the door. I spoke to your father. Lenny didn't acknowledge the words. He sat motionless and unblinking. Stanley shuffled across to where I was sitting and pressed his palms on the table. Lenny left San Diego two weeks ago with a couple of friends. They planned to spend a month hiking the trail north. The father gave me two names, Freddy and Sabrina. When he heard their names, Lenny leaned over and picked up his backpack. He rummaged frantically until he pulled out a stack of Polaroids. He flicked through the photographs and then slapped one on the table. Stanley and I leaned over. Flanking a fitter and healthier Lenny were what must have been Freddy, tall and wearing a baseball cap, and Sabrina, shorter and wearing a bright yellow top with an almost fluorescent blue belt pulling the fabric tight around her waist. Lenny fingered the photo, and tears welled in his eyes. What happened to them? He sobbed and shook his head. He opened his mouth to speak, but no words came out. Stanley took a map down from the wall and pushed it in front of Lenny. We are here. Where did you last see them? Lenny blinked away tears and concentrated. He squinted at the map and pressed his index finger down and tapped it. Stanley took a pencil from his breast pocket and marked the map with a cross. I'll notify the police. Get the truck ready to go. During training they told us about search and rescue operations. The rangers are the first responders. It was part of the job. Twisted ankles and wandering off the trail and getting lost are not uncommon and no reason to get the police involved. But this felt different. I secured the gear in the truck and Stanley appeared, flanked by a police officer in his early thirties. Harry is hitching a ride. His partner will take care of Lenny. We drove up the trail for about 15 minutes with the truck until it grew too narrow and treacherous. We split up the gear between us and set out on foot. Our destination was high up the mountain and far away from the trails. It was almost as if the trails deliberately avoided the area. We hacked our way through the thick forest. How had they ended up all the way out here? Stanley checked his watch constantly as we climbed. He wanted to get there before dark. I figured we would be lucky if we did. Stanley and Harry talked like old friends, asking about each other's wives and children. The park rangers are in effect an extension of law enforcement. It made sense to be friendly with the police, and living in a small mountain town made it almost inevitable. I like that. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Stanley checked the map. Almost there. Get your torches. All right. Harry reached into his backpack and pulled out a flashlight. I did the same. Do you know what's up this way? Stanley said. I shook my head. Somewhere up here is an old cabin. Hunters used it as a base back when you could still hunt up this way. The cross our friend Lenny put on the map is just about on top of it. Let's see if we can get there before there's no light left. We didn't make it by dark. Twilight gave to night with little warning. Soon we were relying on the light from our torches. Being on a trail in the sunshine lends a sense of security up here. 
even when you are alone. Now, surrounded by black and with the trail long behind us, an uneasiness grew in my stomach for the first time. Stanley paused and swept his torch. He muttered something under his breath. Harry took a few steps to the right, lowering his head and squinting. There it is, he said. At the farthest reaches of Harry's torchlight, the cabin emerged from the woods. Stanley tapped Harry on the shoulder. My eyes aren't what they used to be. The cabin should have been a source of comfort, but it only added to my unease. The roof was half caved in and trees encroached on all sides, gnarled branches reaching out like fingers. The structure looked like it belonged more to the forest than to man. The only door hung askew on warped and rusted hinges. Two windows had long ago lost their glass. Stanley shouldered open the door with a grunt. Leaves and branches covered the floor, blown in through the open windows and roof. We dumped the gear inside. Stanley took out a lantern and tied it to a horizontal branch a few paces from the front door. He flicked it on and the light shone bright. If there was anyone lost nearby, they could not fail to see it. We split up and entered the forest, guided by our torches. Stanley instructed us to go no further than the reach of the lantern. It was our lighthouse on the horizon. The wind blew and fresh from the north. I buttoned up my jacket against the cold. The beam from the torch was strong, but aside from the narrow cone of light, the forest was a deep and full dark. Stanley and Harry called out the names of the two missing, Freddy and Sabrina. I did the same. Every few steps I stopped and listened. The forest was alive with the scurrying of animals and insects going about their business, and the constant rustling of the wind through the leaves. It was hopeless. This was needle in the haystack stuff. Freddy or Sabrina could be unconscious on the ground a few feet to my left and I would never see them. We should camp and wait for first light. Harry's voice cut through the night, louder and with urgency. I skipped towards the sound as fast as I dared. The two torchlights of Harry and Stanley played close together, the beams of light trained on the forest floor. You might not want to see this, Stanley said as I came up behind them. It was too late. By the light of the torches I saw him. Flat on his back, arms and legs bent at unnatural angles. I almost gagged when I saw his face. The left side caved in, a red, bloody mess fragmented with the white of the skull. The right side was intact, one green eye staring up, wide and unblinking. The remainder of the face had an almost serene expression. It was not the look of fear that you would expect from someone about to have half their face crushed. No skin remained below the neck, the contents of his torso picked so clean I could see his full spine. What did that? I stammered. I didn't get an answer. Stanley fished the Polaroid from his pocket and studied it under the torchlight. He handed it to Harry. It's him. It's Freddy. Harry jumped and swung his torch out into the woods. I swear I heard someone talking out there, Harry said. We've been calling out their names too. No, it wasn't that. It sounded like whispering. It's the wind through the trees. Harry didn't look convinced. He called out the name of Sabrina and listened. Only the sounds of the forest. Stanley shushed him. There's nothing we can do for the boy now. Let's get back to the cabin and radio down the news. Stanley took a few quick steps towards the cabin and motioned for us to follow. He seemed agitated. I didn't blame him. I followed on his heels. Harry lingered, searching the woods with his torch until he too fell in behind. The inside of the cabin felt like a sanctuary. Out of the wind and removed from the mangled corpse of Freddy, my mind processed the sight. I had gutted my fair share of fish, but this was different. I put my hand to my stomach and swallowed hard. I was overcome with a compulsion to repeat my unanswered question. What could have done that? Before I could, 
Harry gave us some more bad news. There was no response on the radio, only static. It wasn't surprising. The cabin sat in a depression between the peak we crested on our way in and the taller peak beyond. We have to go back, I said. Harry shook his head. Not in the dark, and not when there's someone still out there. We don't know if that girl is dead or alive, Stanley said. I heard her. You heard a whisper is what you said. And if she was there she would have come to the light. She'll come to the lantern and we'll wait for her. Harry threw out his arms in protest. Stanley sighed. If she's dead then we'll find her in the light of morning. If she's alive and nearby enough to whisper in our ears then she'll come to us. Two rectangles of light shone through the open windows from the lantern outside, but the front room of the cabin still had dark shadowy corners. Stanley took a second lantern and tied it to an old light fixture hanging from the ceiling. The room lit up as if under sunlight, but a cold light that gave the room a bare and unwelcome feel. I busied myself clearing a space on the floor beside the black pot belly stove at the rear of the room. Stanley and Harry stood as statues, staring up at the wall behind me. I turned. Etched in black, stood onto the blank wall was some kind of monster, long-limbed and with an elongated skull. It stared back at us through white blobs left clear of black. I took a step back and almost stumbled. What is that? I didn't need an answer. You don't live and work up in the mountains here without hearing the stories. Stories told dismissively by daylight. Like you would talk about the monsters you imagined hiding in your closet as a kid. By night and around a camp fire the stories take on a graver tone. And the name of the monster is only ever whispered. Wendigo. Of course I had never seen one. But if I had to imagine what one might look like, the painting in soot taking up the full height of the wall of the cabin was an exact match. I waited for one of the two men behind me to dismiss what we saw drawn on the wall. To make light of it and crack a joke? Neither did. Stanley uttered a simple instruction. No one goes outside without a weapon. Our shadows danced on the walls. The lantern hanging from the ceiling did not move. Stanley leaned and looked out the window. The lantern hanging from the tree branch swung back and forth like the pendulum of a grandfather clock. There was wind tonight, but not enough to do that. Stanley bent down and fished a rifle from the back. My heart beat like a drum in my ears. And then something else. Whispers. What sounded like the whispers of a girl, entreating us inviting us out into the darkness of the forest. Stanley inched open the door with the muzzle of his rifle. He stepped through the gap and watched the lantern on the tree come to a rest. He stood beside the lantern and searched the corners of the forest illuminated by the light. Nothing moved. Harry unclipped the leather strap on his belt and drew a pistol and went to the doorway. I felt naked and exposed with my hands empty. I took a step backwards, the windigo drawn in soot looming large behind and burning a hole in the back of my head. A shadow flashed through the trees and Stanley swung the muzzle of the rifle and shot, the crack piercing the night. He raised the rifle to his shoulder and flicked it from side to side searching for movement. The lantern boobed up and down. With a rush a long-limbed creature dropped onto Stanley from above. He screamed and wrenched the rifle around, but had it knocked from his grip. Harry fired two shots, and the creature let out a wail. It bound towards the door and Harry slammed it shut. He pointed the pistol to the closed door and emptied the chamber. Harry took a step back and shot me a glance. Through the whole ordeal I had not moved. I had barely breathed. Was it dead? Was Stanley okay? The window... I screamed. The long, thin fingers of the creature wrapped themselves around the inside of the window frame. Then the head appeared, uncannily human-like, but distorted and disfigured. The chin elongated, and the teeth like razors and drenched in blood. 
its eyes white and piercing, just like the etching on the wall. Harry grabbed me by the arm and hauled me into the back room of the cabin. He slammed shut the flimsy door. The back room was windowless and the only light was a thin strip at the base from the lantern in the front room. We crouched together, our shoulders pressed against the door. We listened. The light patter of footsteps, two thin strips of black, interrupted the strip of light at the base of the door. Something stood on the other side. Come out, it is okay. It sounded like Stanley. Had he killed it? Come out. Harry straightened and I grabbed his shoulder. Don't open the door, I whispered. They say a Wendigo can imitate those it kills. My hand brushed against Harry's back and knocked the flashlight from his jacket pocket. I fumbled in the darkness until I found it, and I flicked it on. I scanned the room for something, anything we could use as a weapon. I walked away from the door and kicked at the twigs and leaves on the floor. All that was good for was kindling. Something smelled rotten. There must be a dead rat somewhere. It's Stanley, Harry said. I pointed the torch to him. His eyes were wide and wild. He must have killed it. He smiled at me and took a step back. The door slammed open and carried with it the rotten stench. What stood in the doorway was not Stanley, but the Wendigo. Harry kneeled before it, breathing in the noxious fumes. I shone the torch onto the creature. Its gray skin pulled tight on a gaunt frame. And then something glinted. A belt buckle. Around the creature's waist was the bright blue belt Sabrina wore in the Polaroid. Sabrina? I said. It turned to me and paused, tilting its head to the side. I thought I saw a glimmer of recognition, a brief moment where it knew the name. But then it snarled, its mouth opening wide and dripping with saliva. It wrapped two hands around the neck of Harry and leaned in. I acted instinctively without thinking. I jumped at the creature, swinging the only weapon I had, the torch. I brought it down on its head with all the strength and adrenaline I had. It bucked and sent me flying into the front room beyond. I threw out my hands against the fall and grabbed the lantern Stanley had hung from the ceiling. It could not bear my weight, and the cord pulled out from the ceiling and I fell with a thud. I jumped up at a burst of warmth from my stomach. The lantern had smashed on impact, and the white-hot filament broke free of its casing. I groaned in pain, and the creature lumbered forwards. I retreated into the corner of the room and pulled my knees up to my chest. It stood over me and opened its mouth, razor-sharp teeth gleaming white. Then the smell of smoke. The creature hopped and then scrambled backwards. The leaves and twigs covering the floor ignited under the heat from the lamp filament. A small flame burst up and the creature covered its face. Fire. It didn't like fire. I crawled forwards and swept as much of the kindling as I could grab onto the flames. The fire grew and the creature screamed. As smoke filled the room it coughed and spluttered. It made one last effort to come at me and then retreated out of the room and into the forest. I went to the back room and grabbed Harry. We stumbled out of the cabin, the fire now spreading up the walls and to the roof. Stanley lay below the lantern hung from the tree, unmoving and with a chunk of flesh missing from his throat. We ran into the forest in the opposite direction the creature had gone. We first climbed up to the crest and then back down the mountain. We stumbled our way down by the light of the torch. Adrenaline coursed through our veins, and we imagined that thing right behind us, stalking us in the dark. When we finally crossed a trail, we followed it back down to the ranger station. A team of police and National Guard hiked up to the cabin after the sun rose. The cabin had burned to the ground, the potbelly stove the only item that survived the blaze. The bodies of Stanley and Freddy were brought down. They said Stanley's flesh had been picked clean down to the skeleton. That was the first day of September, 1989. Sabrina was listed as a missing person 
and her father spent a month in the mountains searching for her. But she's gone in every sense that matters. Turned to a wendigo by hunger for human flesh, she transformed into something unrecognizable from where it began. Around campfires, people still tell stories of the wendigo. I don't know if they truly believe they are out there, but I know I have seen it. Sometimes there really is a monster in the closet. There was no consoling her this time. So Holly drove her home, assuring that she will personally keep her up to date with our search. We thought that this was going to be an easy search, so the police weren't involved from the very beginning. Now, the ugly seriousness of this disappearance was beginning to manifest itself. The cops arrived just as Holly was parking her Jeep after driving the mother home. We continued the search through the night through hours and their combined efforts. We found nothing that night, and we found nothing for the next 26 days and nights. All rangers on working neglected their usual duties in favor of this search. We combined our forces with the cops and the numerous volunteers, yet each and every day brought nothing but further disappointment. Each and every day Holly and I would venture deeper and deeper with a search dog, yet we returned empty-handed. Dogs failed to pick up any scent. Aerial searches of the forest revealed nothing. It was like little Chester stopped existing. His mother didn't remain at home, like we advised her. She would wait on the edge of the forest until deep into the night, when we would return to offer her nothing but more disappointment. She even wanted to go look for him herself, but we could not allow her to do so. She was already a mess to begin with, and we had to leave an employee of the reception to be with her so she wouldn't do something to herself. Each time I saw her, my heart hurt more and more, because every time I saw her I could not offer her anything more than disappointment. Holly was acting like she wasn't affected by this at all, but her eyes displayed her immense distress more than words ever could. It was on the 27th of August that we finally found what was left of Chester. This whole ordeal is the reason I cannot sleep without the lights on and a hefty dose of pills. It is the reason I still wake up screaming night after night, reliving those horrible moments. Holly and I spent that entire day searching, and as the night fell, we unanimously decided that we should not return or rest, but rather make haste. We were deep into the forest and the trees and their branches were growing denser every step we took. Our search dog, Jester, was already a senior dog awaiting retirement, yet he was one of the keenest canines we had. He had a long track record of finding teenagers that have wandered off path in their drunken stupor, so we were sure that anything that we missed, he would pick up on. It was around 2 a.m. when we came across a clearing with a small mound of earth at the center. I recognized this place from a map I studied, yet I had to admit both to Holly and myself that I had never been here before. We walked towards the mound and leaned on it, taking deep breaths and enjoying this moment of relaxation. Suddenly, Jester rose up and violently sniffed the air around him before breaking out in a frenzy of barks. We rose up and scanned the area around us with our flashlights, yet nothing seemed out of the ordinary. That's when we took a closer look at Jester, who was still going wild. Jester was barking at the mound. We decided to walk around it and see what was the cause of Jester's concern. I unleashed him and he ran to the other side of the mound. Holly and I walked across it and joined him. He was now deathly silent, unflinchingly focused on one particular spot. Holly and I shined our flashlights to where Jester was pointing. I immediately noticed something peculiar with the spot. Whereas the grass all across the mount was growing and flourishing from the land, here it seemed like it was. Stuffed. I grabbed a handful of the grass and pulled it back, revealing a hard wooden surface beneath it. Holly and I began hastily removing the grass to remove whatever was secluded by it. Our efforts weren't in vain. It was a dry, heavy log, 
standing upright and blocking passage. Shining through the patches that the log failed to obscure, we uncovered that there was definitely some kind of a room in there. A foul smell emanated from there. In hindsight, we should have known what it was. Should we go inside? Holly asked, holding one hand over her nose and asking for my approval. I wish I was more of a craven that day. I wish we had called back up. I wish we never came across that damn mound. Yes, help me pull this damn thing out. I replied, commanding Jester to step back and wait. He obeyed. We grasped the log and pulled it back, revealing an entrance. I will never stop regretting the moment I shone my flashlight inside. On a pile of dry, dirt-stained bones there was a small, frail body. Maggots already found their home inside of him. He had flesh missing from his limbs and face. Yet the most terrifying thing was the fact that his ribcage was ripped open by brute force, and still fresh entrails and blood were splattered all across the dirt floor. I could bear the sight no longer and my arm instinctively rose the flashlight upwards. My sudden movement revealed three pairs of bloodied, dirty feet. I could hear Holly's shallow breaths behind me, almost against my will. I pointed the flashlight up and screamed in horror at the abomination that was revealed to me. Jester's menacing growls filled the screaming silence surrounding us, keeping us captive with these things. There were three of them. They were naked and covered in blood all the way from the tips of their long fingernails to their rotting teeth. Their teeth were revealed by their unsettling grins which almost conveyed pride in their actions. All three of them growled in unison. They let out a raspy, disgusting sound that I fear will never leave my ears. Quick as a bolt of lighting, they stood up and lunged towards me. Jester rushed in and grabbed the leg of the closest one yet he paid him no mind. I drew my gun out, yet I managed to fire only a single well-placed shot in the stomach of the thing Jester attacked before they overwhelmed me and my consciousness failed me. It was Holly that saved my life as I would later come to know when she and my other colleagues visited me in the hospital. As those things tried to devour me right then and there, Holly emptied a full magazine in them, and then another one, for good measure. Yet she herself was unconsolable due to the fact that she accidentally shot Jester, who leaped into the air to snatch the neck of one of those monsters. So there you have it. That's why I quit being a park ranger. That's why I cry when I see a fucking tree. My heart shattered to a million pieces when I heard that Chester's mother shot herself. But do you know when I cried the hardest? This morning, while drinking coffee and watching the news on TV, I screamed at the TV and threw the remote with all my might, shattering the display when the fucking news anchor reported that a teenage girl was reported missing in the national park.